Hello and welcome to Diane Writes. Uh, this is my, what, like, third episode now. Good afternoon, Birdie25. Nice of you to join me today. Hey, how you, how's it going? And welcome to Undead Hero. Thanks for joining me. So, um, as usual, <laughs> <laughs> it's because I've been concentrating on my world animal projects. I haven't gotten any writing done in the past week that's writing writing. I've been working on my history challenge for world anvil. I'm flushing out the history of the sisterhood of the den mother, which is an, a very important uh, group in the course of the toy soldier novels. So um, I even did original art for it. I wonder, yeah, you know what? I'll show you. I think I got it on my, yeah, I do. I got it right here. And this is like, okay, so I don't know, right? I haven't done, like, physical art in a while. Brody B says, uh, it's going good. I'm just working on some editing. Cool. Editing's good. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm at the stage in the history challenge now. Oh, and thank you for the follows. Uh, actually, I've, I see I owe a few since my last broadcast. Thank you for the follow. Chris likes to write. Brody B25. And... Uh, Wa Broken Jack, or W-A Broken Jack, I don't know how they prefer to be called. Birdie B says, I'm an editor, so that's always my favorite part. Editing is a really unappreciated art. Unless you've done it, then you have no idea how, or worked with a really good editor, then you have no idea how important <laughs> it really is. Writing is a collaborative effort between you and your editor, if you are the author, and they are just as important to making the story excellent as the initial writer in the first place. So, no, it's true. <laughs> Birdie B says, thank you. I like you. No, well, it's true. Like, I've had uh, I've had some really good editors, and I've had uh, well-meaning editors that I haven't been as happy with because they just don't get what I'm trying to do. And uh, ultimately, I, you know, and I've done editing, right? Uh, so I put out an anthology about a year ago. And yeah, it's it's really unappreciated. It's like uh, it's like making the diamond shiny, you know. It's it's and it's a lot of work, and it's an underappreciated skill. My editor is amazing. So, Birdie B says it's certainly a collaborative effort. And yes, it is. And hello, honey. I see that Aaron Ree has joined us. That's my hubby. He says hey all. So cool. So anyway, I was going to show you my art. Yeah, um, I. Don't uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in my physical art, right? I guess I, you know, I was one of those uh, kids that needed a lot of, I still need a lot of encouragement. Who am I kidding? <laughs> I was one of those kids that really needed a lot of encouragement. So I, uh, you know, I didn't get as much in my art, I guess, as I did in my writing. And the last time I did art of any significance was more than two years ago. And the last time I did a pencil crayon sketch, which is what this is, was... <laughs> Maybe the 90s, <laughs> maybe the turn of the millennium. It's been a while, but I guess uh, I haven't forgotten things because I was pretty happy with this. Anyway, this is the piece. So, and uh, that's for my uh, orcish uh, priestess's article. So, I'm really unhappy with it. Oh, thank you, Birdie Bee. Birdie Bee says very nice. Aha, I wondered if that was the case. Uh, W.A. Broken Jack says, hello, excited to join. Uh, W.A. Broken Jack is for World Anvil Broken Jack. So you're Broken Jack from now on when I speak about you, because that will be easier. Um, and <laughs> Bernabe said, hello, hubby. Right, um, Aaron was talking to True Undead Hero and said, when did you ask? I missed it. I don't know what he's asking about. Oh, okay. Trended Hero says, what is the best place to start a story? All right, we're getting into the AMAs right away. Awesome. All right. Uh, before conflict arises or just as it is arising, I was always told that the start of the story should have some semblance of normalcy, but open them into conflict. Oh, hello, J.M. Baldwin. Um, says, hey, Diane, how are you? I'm good today. I'm excited to get some manuscript work done. So, um, thanks for joining me. I, I hope you guys are into writing too. Okay, so um, I am currently reading a book called uh, Writing the Breakout Novel. 
by Donald Mass, who is like the guy in charge of one of the big um, agent agencies out there. He works with a lot of uh, really like he works with PD James is one of his clients, right? Um, works with uh, a, a lot of big name science fiction fantasy writers, right? Like uh, Nendi Akorafor and, uh, you know, uh, quite a few people in the field like that, right? And um, so what he says is that you should always start as the conflict is beginning to unfold, right? So I'll already get your reader like thinking about what's going on and get them you know, immersed into it and follow. And if you can't do that, because you need to establish the normalcy first, which, you know, can be important to your story, right? Then you have to establish bridging conflicts, little things that keep the reader reading to find out what's going on that will eventually lead to the big conflict, right? So, um, um, that's the, um, probably the height of professional wisdom on the topic right now. And uh, I'm inclined to agree that you need to kind of give the readers something to draw them in, right? I was talking about it on the last stream, but because I was having problems with the stream going down frequently, I got cut off, I realized. But I was talking about uh, Stephen King's first line of the uh, Dark Tower series. And what he said was, and they teach this in writing classes now, right? And it was, uh, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed, right? And uh, so why that's a great first line is because, first of all, you have questions. Who's the gunslinger? Who's the man in black? Why is he the man in black? Why is he a gunslinger? What does that mean in this context? Why are they in this desert? Why is the gunslinger chasing the man in black? What's the deal between them, right? And it gets you kind of trying to figure that out. And it takes the whole first book basically for you to figure that out. He unfolds it in bits and pieces as part of the ongoing dialogue is going on. And I think that it's probably because of the way he did that, that I chose to open my Weird West series with the flashbacks in the way that I did, because he did that. Um, by contrast, in the Toy Soldier Saga, I have to establish the motivations for why my main character, Shondar Sunfall, is doing the things that he is doing. And um, it's, uh, it's complex because it really stems from childhood issues. And I had a back and forth with my editor over it because he does not like, um, like to him, it feels like a YA type thing and he just doesn't like YA, right? And I'm trying to lose some of that tone in the rewrite, but the truth is it does root in what happens as kids. So I have to do bridging conflicts in order to carry it on. Anyway, I, I sent it to another friend of mine to edit after I had just cut the first part with the YA type stuff, the childhood stuff, which is what my editor suggested because I couldn't figure out how to fix it. And uh, there was an unmitigated disaster because the reader who is a friend of mine and, you know, was being nice to me and, you know, then not therefore sparing the rod, so to speak, so that I would be humiliated, not in private rather than public, was telling me basically that my character seemed like a Mary Sue and I, you know, he had no idea why he was doing any of the things he was doing. And it's because where it starts after that, there's a bit of a reprieve, right? Where things start going well for him, right? So I had to put it back in. So it really depends on the story you're trying to tell, I guess would be the answer. Okay, scrolling back to make sure I haven't missed anything. Birdie B said, have some confidence next time. That was really good. Oh, thank you. Hands are always hard. So I have discovered. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and if you don't have confidence in yourself, no one else is going to have confidence in you. That is true. Oh, thank you for the host, Ross. Ross Script Writing is now hosting me. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Trended Hero says, right now I've been spending the weekend writing on my intro outline as well as my three main characters. Good stuff. If you're a plotter, it's always good to start with an outline. I cannot give you any advice in that department, however, because I have tried many times to do an outline, and this is not the way my brain works. I fail catastrophically at it. 
I, uh, I took uh, James Patterson's master class when that was the only writing uh, master class being offered at that, uh, um, I don't know, what do you call platform, I guess. And I didn't do like half the course because he writes more on the outline than he does in the book. He's got the outline done before he puts a single um, thing to pay to paper and it takes him much less time to do the actual book than it does to the outline and I just don't work that way it's just not my the way my brain works I, I feel almost like I've written the story if I've written the outline so yeah um, uh, Jenna Marassi does outlines she's got very good advice about that I recommend her channel right but I'm not qualified to tell you how to deal with outlines so Bertie B says, Brendan Sanderson was talking about how your first chapter should make a promise to the reader. That's also a good way of looking at it. I agree. Yeah. And then the book is making good on that promise. That's right. I, yeah, absolutely. That's a, another good way of thinking about it. You've got to let people know this is kind of where I'm going. This is what it's about, right? Oh, hello, story girl. Nice to see you. Thanks for the follow. Glad you could join me today. How are you? J.M. Baldwin says, start as late as possible. Seems to be the general rule that I find. I try and weave an undertone of tension or a subtle sense of something is going to change as I write my ordinary world segment. Yeah, that's a, a good way of handling it too. I also heard someone say to you, okay, so once you're done, just go back and whatever you said was chapter one, just cut it. <laughs> right? And if you really feel there's piece of information in chapter one that the writer absolutely, or the reader absolutely must have, put it in the new chapter one, which was your chapter two. I don't know, but um, there's at least one story where I'm doing exactly that. So, Bobacus, hello! Thanks for joining me! Bobacus has question. J.M. Baldwin says to Birdie B, I like that, which is the uh, promise to the reader comment. Yep. Yeah. Um, Babaka says, how do you edit something you already like? Birdie B says, with difficulty. Good answer. Babaka says, oh, right. You do continuous editing, don't you? Um, Jam Baldwin says uh, to Babaka, I try and get some beta, okay, yeah, beta readers or critique partners. They will help look at your work from a less, ob or a, well, I'd say more objective is probably what you meant. More objective perspective, less personal, right? And a fresh pair of eyes might pick up on things that you'll overlook due to reading it too many times. And that is the truth. It becomes very hard when you've read it many times and you like what you're doing to redo it. Aaron Ree says, Bobacus, don't edit your own work. I agree with that 100%. Uh, always get somebody else to do your editing because it's like doing your own tarot readings. It's impossible to be objective. You see what you want to see. And you're not aware if you're communicating something badly or if you're not communicating something you intended to communicate, I find. Uh, sometimes when people read it and they haven't heard it before, they'll say, well, what is this all about? And I realize, you know, I just had it in my head and I didn't bother to explain, right? And it's good to catch up on stuff like that. Story Girl says, hi, hi. Sorry I wasn't following earlier. No, that's cool. I'm glad you could join me now. Uh, True Undead Hero says, I'd love to share my three perspectives, but I don't want to flood the screen, the stream. <laughs> Good point. But, um, you know, um, yeah, if you can do it briefly in like one liners, that would be cool. Story Girl says, I was wondering why I couldn't see you online. Uh, Birdie B says, well, edit your own work to an acceptable standard. Yes, you should always edit it yourself first before you take it to other people so that you're not embarrassed to take it out in public. Uh, send it to an editor. Realize it's not as good as you thought it was. That is absolutely the fact. Edit it again. Yep, that is true. It never is. You, We love our babies no matter how ugly they are, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, get somebody else to look at your baby and accept that they're going to tell you it's ugly. Yeah. Birdie B says, that's the process I'm in the middle of. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to interrupt there to, to before it gets too far to answer the, um, to talk about editing in the way that, because um, there was a question about it, right? Um, how do you know, how do you edit something you already like? Okay, so yes, there's a lot of good advice in there about 
get other people to look at it. Yes, you should. When you're doing it yourself, I do a little bit of continual editing. Like I, I do tend to edit my manuscript somewhat as I go, but I also do a uh, master, at least one master edit once everything is done more like two or three, right? At least. Right. And that's with the continual editing. Like, I think I've officially called this my 12th edit now on the first novel in this series. Right. And that's just what I've officially called it. Never mind the stuff way I've gone. Okay. But um, if you're editing it yourself for the first time, move it into a different format. Right. Like, if you've been working with it on Word in your, uh, your desktop, move it to your phone, read it there, see what it sounds like. Better yet, read it out loud see what it sounds like. Record yourself reading it out loud, right? Um, I've discovered this quite by accident because I read my manuscripts for my patrons. It's something my patrons get is a video or audio stream of me reading my stories. And I, you know, realize that sometimes there, you know, I have missed some things that's not as cool as I thought it was. It's really awkward to say, whatever, right? So looking at it in a different medium can help you get fresh eyes on it, even if you've looked at it a thousand times, right? So Story Girl says, for anyone who hasn't come across it before, the Story Grid is a great resource for editing and story analysis, and I have not. So I will take a look at that. Thank you for the advice. It's by a professional editor named Sean Coyne. Okay, cool. All right, I will I will check that out later. The story grid. All right, I'll remember that. Jan Baldwin says, editing and rewrites are my favorite part of the process, strangely enough. I just like to see how tight I can make the plot. Trimming away the excess fat from the story is oddly satisfying, but that's just me. Birdie B says, yeah, good editors aren't cheap, but worth it. That is absolutely true. Invest the money and the time into your book if you love it right? Because it will be worth it. The big thing that I find, there is a lot of stigma um, towards independent writers. And I believe the reason is 100% editing, right? Because a lot of new writers, they, they put it out, right? They're, they're self-publishing, you know, there's lots of reasons to choose self-publishing, but, um, you know, and, and some of it is lack of confidence, that people have that they will get traditionally published and other people just want more creative control and still others have a weird idea that they believe in but publishers aren't sure that they can market and that's its own thing right um the truth is publishing is a business right and they are there to make money now most publishers i find care very much about literature and the written word but they also know that they have to sell, right? And if they don't sell, they have no company and they can't produce literature. So sometimes if you have a truly innovative idea, you, or you, you know, you might be a madman, right? But you might have something that's really cool and they're not gonna publish it because they don't wanna take the risk. And that's happened with a lot of, uh, a lot of really famous novels, right? And uh, there's probably been 17,000 times as many flops as a result of that, but you know, you know, if we love our babies, maybe we want to take the risk. So that's one another reason. But editing is where it falls down because, like me, right? When you know, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, I wanted to put something out. Right. Fortunately, I am uh, I am blessed to know a really good editor who is willing to work with me on a personal arrangement about it. But um, a lot of times people don't have, you know, they're like, wow, that's a lot of money. I don't know if I, you know, and then their book is not good. And it is not good, not because they're not good writers, because they haven't gotten the diamond polished. And you can tell, right? I read, I'm not going to name it, but I read this amazing science fiction novel about a resettlement on Mars from an independent writer who I thought was really amazing. Like, just amazing but there were so many things right like a consistent misuse of an apostrophe s that just distracted me and there was a, another thing where uh, she understood the technology that she wanted to communicate used the wrong word didn't catch it and consistently used that through the whole book and I'm like, that's not how that technology works, but I know what you meant, 
right? A good editor would have caught that, right? And she wouldn't have been embarrassed like that. And, you know, I, I mean, like, I, I think that, I mean, her cover was beautiful. Like I said, she had everything going for her except the editing. So please don't do that to yourself. Do not shoot yourself in the foot. Okay? Right. Now, Birdie B says, edit backwards. Aha, that's another good idea. Go through, identify problem areas, and then do it from the bottom up. Yes, I think that's a good way too, because then you're, you know, viewing it from a different perspective again. Okay, True Undead Hero expounded on his theory. He says, basically, in the first chapters, my three uh, characters, uh, MCs, are a field marshal is returning to his best friend's home, who is now ascending to emperor. The emperor is being pressured by family to maintain the status quo in the aftermath of their previous emperor's death. The nation is still in mourning. They need a strong leader. A small peasant is forced into exile from his home. He makes his way towards the capital, but is stopped by monks. He joins them in hopes of finding God. Um, Babacus says, reading it out loud works for me for getting the language right. Really helps. But my biggest problem is pacing. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That was your outline. I like it, actually. Yeah, that's a good start. I get the idea. Um, yeah. Why? Did, um, I only have one question, and that is, why did the peasant decide that... Uh, well, okay, a couple. One is, why is he a small peasant or she? Right? Um, is it, like, stature? I'm a, I'm a small peasant, right? Or is it uh, um, that they're, you know, not significant a lowly peasant, right? I don't know, right? Um, makes way, way towards the capital. Yeah, he, right, sorry. Makes his way towards the capital, but is stopped by monks. Why is he going to the capital? Is he going to the capital to, like, foment rebellion? Is he going to the capital to seek help? Is he going to the capital to, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, get restitution? Like, what? You know, I'd like to know a bit more about the, the motivations there, right? And I, yeah. Okay. Babaka says, reading it out loud works for me, but getting the language right really helps. Or, for getting the language right really helps. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. See? Reading it out loud. <laughs> but my biggest problem is pacing. I go too fast, according to most, which I never see, even when pointed out. I could slow things down, add more detail, but it goes against my instincts. Well, that might be a matter of personal preference from the people that you're sharing it with. I know that there are a lot of fast paced books out there that, yeah, and this is like where publishing is currently going because as publishing becomes more and more expensive, they just don't want to put as many pages in the book, right? So if they can do it in two, they don't want to do it in three. So that you might have an asset there. On the other hand, you might be an underwriter and maybe what's happening is that people aren't getting motivation. Let me, let me use an example, okay? Right. Game of Thrones. Oh, by the way, my hubby gave me this. It's pre... Okay, but Game of Thrones. Um, he knows me so well. <laughs> okay, um, the first three seasons were generally agreed upon to be the best. And why? Because things took time, right? We, I mean, there was always something happening. But we got to know the characters, we got to know their motivations, we understood the, the chain of cause and effect, right? The way the sequence of events worked, right? We understood all that. Um, the last season is generally agreed upon to be the worst. And why? Because it was so fast, right? There was, there was no time to adjust to any trauma. There was no time to really grasp what the characters' motivations were. Um, stuff wasn't explained that could have been that could have made sense right like um um okay i don't know war writers okay i talk with a lot of them cuz i'm writing about a war right okay so um the charge of the dothraki right okay so why the hell were they using light cavalry like that will war writers will say they'll be like you know that is the dumbest use 
Why would you do that? That is the inevitable result. When you put light cavalry at infantry in a head-on charge like that, they're going to get slaughtered. That's not what they're for. Light cavalry is supposed to use its maneuverability to work around and keep coming back and stay out of the way and keep picking off uh, some of the forces in, you know, sequence, right? Like, that's how you use them in actual war. It's even true today, right? Only now we do it with, like, you know, aircraft, right? So, you know, you're not going to fly a bunch of aircraft into a bunch of anti-aircraft guns for the sake of, you know, where the base is. I mean, that's just stupid. You're using your aircraft to protect your land troops so that they can go and break through because they're the heavy infantry, right? Okay, but anyway, right, why did they do that? I actually know a reason why they would do that, right? Politically, right, if you've read, read the books and you understand the character of the Dothraki, you realize that you can't, I mean, like, you could have used them that way, <clears throat> but first of all, in that scenario, that's uh, a very, you know, like, it's a gamble because... They have archers too. Every one of the Dothraki who are killed will rise up and become part of the army of the dead. You know, like, it's it's awkward, right? Secondly, it didn't put bodies between them and Winterfell, right? But that's still, I mean, I still would have used them that way, right? But the truth is they would be almost useless in that fight. And they would have picked off a couple of stragglers and that's about it. And that's only if John and Daenerys manage to keep the dragon busy enough that, you know, the, you know, whatever King Lich dude was riding, you know, like, um, if only if they manage to keep him busy enough not to just pick off all the Dothraki, right? But, um, okay, so what the most effective use of uh, of them would have been, given the situation, was to send them down into the southern part of Westeros to raid Cersei's lands, right? And keep them busy and wear, wear them down, right? That would have been the most effective political use. And But the reason why they can't do that is because they can't control the Dothraki, right? The only person they're going to follow there is Daenerys, right? So Daenerys would have to go with them. They needed her at Winterfell. So this was not an effective use, and that's why they did that. But you don't know any of that because they never bothered to explain it in the story, right? The other thing is Melisandre's capture and, you know, subsequent death. I, I think we had like 20 minutes of actual footage, time, and, and film bef between them. Like, we didn't have time to absorb what was going on. We don't know how she was captured. They didn't bother to show that. Why would she have been undefended? That makes no sense. And we don't know any of that, right? So if they'd taken the time to slow that down, like, I honestly believe that if they'd done the last season as two seasons, maybe even three, I wouldn't have objected to the arcs going where they were going, right? Anyway, okay. Big tangent, but I, th I think it illustrates the point, right? I, on the other hand, am an overwriter. <laughs> I constantly have to cut things. Okay. The peasant is small, says Turundid Hero, not only in stature, but in, like, you know, build, right? It's very weak looking. A lot of people from the isolated regions going to the capital area are going to the capital area because it's where the larger cities are and where a lot of serfs and peasants go to find new lives and work. That makes sense. <clears throat> J.M. Baldwin says the speed of the last two seasons just gave me whiplash it went from a slow burn political fantasy drama to video game logic can't agree more <laughs> yeah Bobacus the knighted king or whatever I gotcha yeah okay all right so if uh, there are no more questions at the moment then I think I'm going to get into some writing. How about you guys? Are you into doing some word sprints with me? No, you guys are here for the questions? Oh, fair enough. Oh, let's see here. 
this is. What I am working on today, you will find that it's exactly where it was last time. <laughs> so. Why do you do that, you bastard thing? No, nope, now it's completely a pain in the ass thing. Now it's doing the other thing. All right. Let's recapture that. Okay, now we're back to where we should be, are we? Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, lots of comment. Jan Baldwin says, I'm down to do a little outlining, so I'll sprint that. Awesome. Babaka says, I just watched a Mentos and sugar thing where the Coke floated away after exploding. That's fun to watch, isn't it? Broken Jack says, I'm down to sprint. To run dead hero, teasing me, which I deserve, says, what is the sprint time? Eight minutes, 10 minutes, 150 minutes. Let's start with a, you know, 10 or 15 minute one, shall we? Birdie B said, I don't sprint so much as hang out and chill. That's totally fine. That's absolutely cool. To run dead hero says, he wants to do 15 minutes. Babaka said, uh, like a gosh darn balloon, which of course is carrying on what he was saying about the coke floating away. Neat. Right. Uh, Broken Jack says, got an article to finish today. Are you working on the history challenge too? Because like I'm doing the weeding stage there right now. I'm like, okay, I am at uh, 2,700 words. Maybe if I cut this diplomacy thing, do I really need that? You know, that's where I am. Babaka says he's going to do an outline for the sprint. Story Girl says I'm not fussed about time frame. I have some work to do on a chapter in a novel. Great. All right. Well, seeing no objections to the contrary, and it being like quarter to two by my clock, let's do 15 minutes, shall we? And you know what? Once again, I did not bring my goddamn alarm. Okay. I will be right back. One second, because that works really well. Just a second. All right, I am back. Phone with the, okay, I should show you that. That is from the art for the anthology that I edited, which is called um, Gunsmoke and Dragon Fire, a fantasy Western anthology. So, okay, clock, stopwatch. No, timer. All right, there we go. <coughs> Story Girl says, how about 24 is in 24 minutes? Then it fits a Pomodoro window. <laughs> cool. Um, can if you want, but I no, I'll, I'm going to do 15 minutes to start because I told the hubby I would do 15 minutes. So, okay. Broken Jack says, I'm not doing the challenge as I'm building up to a summertime novel writing in a newer world. I will rejoin challenges this fall. That's awesome. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Story Girl says, grin. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to change the music here. Actually, uh, 
See, <clears throat> I'm using Sirenscape for the music. This is very, like, elfy sounding music to me. And I'm writing in Orc World right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so I'm like... But the problem with this is that it's not a continual music track. It takes breaks. Because, you know, it's designed for being on with a role-playing game, right? And I don't think I'm ready for the uh, continual epic star battle, because that's like, you know, lots of strings and da na 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 you know, so. Um... Well, I suppose I can go back to the water deep music. Let's try that. Nah. Nah, not happy with that one. Oh, I'm just gonna switch over here. I'm dithering about this too much. There we go. All right, and we begin.
We're about halfway through the sprint.
little less than a minute left. time. I love that alarm. It's so peaceful. Oh. Oh. There we go. Hit the wrong button. All right. Well, actually, I think I started out really slow, but because I had to reread and remember what the hell I was doing, but I got was pretty good when I got going. I did, what was it? Oh, I had it and I lost it. Do, 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 do. All right, 243 for me, so not bad considering I started out really slow. 243. Story Girl said she did 315. Good job. You're winning so far. Yep, still winning. True Undead Hero did 256. I see everybody kicked my butt. That's great. Awesome, awesome. All right. Good job. Jan Baldwin said only 213 for me, but it was an outline for a scene that I've been struggling to plan. So excellent. Then you're up because outlining is much more difficult to get good word count on. I know. Ah, Broken Jack, I hate you. He did 400. <laughs> or she actually I guess I don't know Jack spelt that way could be either or or they I don't know let me know in the chat uh, story girl said eh I don't consider sprints to be a competition neither do I really I mean like I like a little bit of like you know friendly good nature teasing and ribbing can be fun and uh, but it's all about your personal best right it's not about beating other people. This music's a little loud, eh? I need to turn it down. It was fine when we were sprinting, but not so much now. There we go, that's better. Yeah! Birdie B said, I managed to finish redoing some troubled paragraphs. Always good. Yes. And Story Girl congratulated Broken Jack, which is awesome. Now, what did I miss? Well, I was, uh, doing my thing. Let's see here. <laughs> Birdie B was like, da na 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 <laughs> or da na 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 <laughs> I don't know which it was intended, but like, dramatic music. Yeah, as we got started. Trended Hero said, I've been watching this show on Netflix called The Last Tsars, which is a tragic story of Tsar Nicholas II and the rise of the Russian Revolution. Yeah, you were talking about that on my Discord the other day, or yesterday rather. It sounded really good. Definitely sounds like my thing. Yeah, great little series, he says. What was that? I was blasting music. <laughs> we were getting started on the writing, I guess. Uh, Ross script writing showed up with big eyes. Big, like, googly eyes is great and says hello there hey okay. oh thank you for the follow cody bookworm welcome glad you could join us uh we're just doing the writing questions answered ama chat i thought i turned that off just a second i have two different musics running at the same time here right so in between the word sprints did i not turn you off yes i did okay it says it's not ready. Oh, it must have just been... Okay. It sounded discordant for a minute, so I wasn't sure about it. Okay. All right. All right. Anyway, Ross says, hello there. 
Birdie B says, hey, Ross. And they're chatting back and forth. Hey, Birdie B. Trended Hero screams, how am I stuck on a name? Frig, you know what I do when I run into that in a word sprint or something like? I just put big X, you know, capital X, name X, or like three X's, right? And then I go back and fix it later. I, I, I do not remember dates worth a damn, right? So when trying to plot out the time uh, progression of my story, I always forget what the frick month I'm on. You know, I, you know, what year is it? I don't know. So I just often put blanks, X's in the spot where I can't think of a name. Or if you really want to do it, put in brackets, think of name later in capital letters. I do that kind of thing too. Birdie B says, Harold as a suggestion. Trended here is like, no, no, no. Right? Birdie B says, name them Harold. Trended Hero says, I'm looking for an emperor name. Harold could be an emperor's name. Absolutely could. Harold, uh, Harold Hardrada. You know, uh, all kinds of Saxon kings named Harold. Anyway, right? And he knows that too. Yeah, because he is a history major. So, Babaka said, I did nothing but research. It was good research. Excellent. No problem. You guys use the time however you want while you're hanging out with me. Whatever gets you to the next step is great. You know, that's cool. Now, am I caught up? Have I missed anything? Oh yes, I've broken quite, I've missed quite a few in the meantime here. So, after our word count totals, uh, Broken Jack said he with a smile. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. That's awesome. Yeah, don't want to get it wrong. Story Girl says, in my case, I had to outline some characters briefly, and then once I started writing it, it was content that I'm already pretty familiar with. Already broken the outline for the novel, so it's more expanding on what I've already got. Well, that's excellent. That's a good place to be in when you're doing a sprint, I think, right? Because you know where you are, you know where you're going, you've got a pretty clear, uh, you know, concept. But yeah, but you got to start with the characters. So probably you'd have been a lot uh, higher total if you weren't, you know, doing the outline at the beginning too, right? Birdie B says, it was my impression of your impression of sci-fi music. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> hey, I like sci-fi music. Don't, 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 don't be dissing me there. I, I, I'm, I'm like a real sci-fi nerd, actually. But no, I'm kidding. It's fine. Okay, True Undead Hero says, Do you believe the fantasy settings need fantasy names? Like, I struggle so much with names. Absolutely not. I do not believe it at all. The only fantastical names in Game of Thrones were the Valerian names. That is it because it was supposed to be an exotic and weird culture, right? Everything else was totally based in medieval Europe. It was done quite deliberately. I saw an interview with, uh, you know, George R. R. Martin, where he's like, people always have these crazy names and, you know, nobody's ever named the same thing. And I don't think that's realistic. I mean, they're always, you know, you have like Duke Harold, speaking of Harold, right? Duke Harold and King Harold and, you know, uh, Lord Harold, and they're all different people. and. You know, then they end up with nicknames, you know, Harold the Just, Harold the, you know, uh, Harold the Ugly, you know, whatever, right? No, you don't. Absolutely not. Uh, you're writing your culture uh, sort of loosely based on, like, um, uh, the, the Russian historical period there, right? Is that, you know, where you were inspired by, right? To run it here, if I recall. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not mixing this up with your other project. But why not look to Russian names for inspiration? The, the king's name is Ivan, you know? <laughs> it's, you know? Right? Pretty common name, right? So, you know, no, it doesn't have to be fantastical names. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes I find that stuff just distracting, right? Like, I had to do it to some degree because my characters are orcs and elves and you know and this is not our world right but in the weird west right my characters names are uh graham and sarah and piper which is a little bit unusual but not that weird and haywood you know it's like normal names and some of those people are elves so uh, Genevieve was was a name for an elfin character, right? Everybody called, well, her husband called her Jenny. She wouldn't let anybody else call her Jenny, right? So, you know, 
and it's because it's our world in a post-apocalyptic magical future right so no doesn't matter Bobacus illustrates name in the you know pointed brackets right there's a different name for those I don't remember what it is right um, insert lush description here yep <laughs> you know what I've done is insert battle scene here when I couldn't figure out like plot it out in my head and I knew I had to have, I've done that okay yep true undead hero uh, okay uh, Jam Baldwin says to true undead hero I mean imagine a world a little middle earth and your protagonist is named Bob actually I love that never mind <laughs> it depends what you're trying to accomplish right um, MC gets MacGuffin here yep absolutely you bet you get stuck you know give yourself those and and the idea is try not to use that anywhere else so then you can just use find right your find function in your uh, editing program word whatever it is right to find that later so you know okay I need to f insert something here right and that way you won't miss it on the edit turned it here said how would you pronounce pronounce well it's ALS D A I R um, JM Baldwin says Al Esther Al Esther right Bobacus said the same thing trended hero says Emperor Al Esther the fifth or Al Esther which is Gaelic for Alexander yeah so either one uh, yeah, did I get that right? Turn it here said both those things. Okay, Bobica said, Ethel read the unready. True it here is like, yes, Russia. Or yeah, Russia, just to confirm, right? Birdie B says, I'm a word file. I repeat things I like to hear. It's not meant to be mocking in any way. I'm just a weirdo. It's cool. No problem. Yeah. J.M. Baldwin says, I agree, unpronounceable names in a densely packed high fantasy novel can get a little jarring. Yeah, don't make it distracting, you know, make the name something your um, audience is going to remember, right? Like, do people call her Daenerys or Daenerys? We don't really know. Actually, uh, um, George R. R. Martin pronounced it uh, Daenerys, right? Most other people pronounce it Daenerys, right? Everyone calls her Danny, right? Because... Give them something that people can remember because then if it seems too weird people won't empathize with it right which is uh actually that can be a problematic issue i'll i'll put an asterisk on that right and that is something that uh writers of color used to get told when trying to publish their novels oh this is an african name nobody will identify with it nonsense if it's an african culture and you're writing about african people name them african things like don't be stupid you know just if you like right you might do as much uh, um, like compromise as maybe choosing a name that can be easily pronounced by the audience you're intending it for or that you can make a nickname out of that your readers will remember but honestly if you're trying to assert um, the, the importance of the culture don't don't accommodate like that anyway okay uh, story girl says there's also a lot of little tricks you can use when creating fantasy names take a name pick a version of that name from a different language and then twist it with morphemes associated with yet another culture that is excellent advice for fantasy names I find that works really well I have done that definitely uh, you know she gives an example Ivan, Ivar, some basic uh, name root from Russian and Scandinavian. Yep, right. Story, uh, and then says so. Francis could become Frankar, etc. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, doesn't that sound like a fantasy name to you, Frankar, Ivar? I mean, yeah, it does, right? But it's just a variation of something that's more common. So that's great. I, I think those are excellent fantasy names, by the way. Uh, Birdie B says, and many people only read the first two and last two letters. Yes, that is true. All the jumble in the middle gets forgotten, so the tree elves named uh, tree elves named La A are going to become one. Yes, yeah, 
law space A. Um, I realized that I'd done that with a couple of the elf names in my book, actually, and had to make a change. There were two different Loroths, and they were spelt in different ways. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm... I might keep it, though. I might keep it because they're very different characters. One's a younger elf and one is an older, uh, sort of a, you know, a friendly old guy they know, right? So, yeah. A story girl says, likewise, some French Frankish names end with Lys. So you could have Ivelis or Ivelis. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Trina here says, was looking at names and found this gem from Poland of how they spell Christopher. <laughs> Christoph. 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 I, you know what? My ancestors are from Poland. Do you think I can pronounce Polish? <laughs> I hope I'm not butchering things too terribly. I just don't understand how the language rules work. Is what the problem is. Okay, J.M. Baldwin says, I liked how a lot of the Game of Thrones names could be modernized into common names. Uh-huh. Arya, Arya. Uh, yeah, the, just different spellings of Arya. Caitlin, Catelyn, Eddard, Edward. Feels familiar, but still fantasy. Yeah, Story Girl says, Polish names. What are vowels? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I actually think that the intention is for, you know, all, when they have all the... Um, consonants together that they are meant to be pronounced as one sound, right? So, yeah, but, right, that's why I, I don't feel like I know how the language rules work, so I don't know how to pronounce them properly. I probably should learn more about it, actually, but... I'm not entirely convinced, by the way, they're uh, jam that those uh, um, slightly, you know, fantasy but familiar sounding names aren't actually older forms of the names. They might be old English forms of the names and whatnot because uh, Martin drew a lot from medieval uh, European and particularly medieval English and French culture. So, I don't know. <laughs> Aaron Reese says, hey, there's a... There's a Y and an O in there. Story Girl says, Y is technically not a vowel. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> Aaron says, says who? <laughs> Jam Baldwin says, very true. Story Girl says, and O's don't count because they're part of how the Polish language is gendered. Now that's something I did not know. Neat. See? Language rules. I gotta learn them. I like the sound of Polish when I hear it. I wish I could pronounce it. <laughs> figure out how to read it all right so I'm up to date on the chat I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything they want to talk about but I'm gonna take a five minute bio break so I will be back in a couple minutes if you think of anything in the meantime feel free to type it in the chat let me know and if you uh, you know just want to get back to another writing sprint we will do that as soon as I get back all right See you in a minute, guys.
All right, I am back. Thanks for your patience, guys. And I have sat on my headphone cord. <sighs> well, okay, it's more accurate to say I rolled over it. So, all right. I gotta get wireless headphones or something. <clears throat> so many cords all over the floor here. There we go. Sorry about that. I realized that it is actually running two things of music in the background. I didn't turn off the elf at night music before I put on the jungle music to soundtrack. So, but I don't think it's that annoying. So actually it's kind of bridging the gaps between, so I might leave it. All right, have I missed anything since I've been gone? J.M. Baldwin says, since I write urban fantasy, I guess I don't have these weird name issues. My names are pretty modern. Yes, I would agree. It, I mean, urban fantasy makes that a lot easier, doesn't it? Because why would your, unless your character is like a 400-year-old vampire, right? Maybe their name is John, you know? <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. 
True Undead Hero was starting a thing here. Story Girl said, okie dokie, right? True Undead Hero said, huh, apparently Ivan is Russian for John. I knew that, actually. Yep. I may just name him Alexander. Alexander and Milo's. Uh, Sasha and Milo's. That's cool. Sure. Every czar was named Alexander. There were like a million of them, right? So... Ivan, Ian, Giannis, Giannis, and John. Yeah. The okie dokie was about your AFK. I figured. Yeah, that's cool. I'm just kind of reading the chat because I also send these to YouTube and that way people know what they have missed, right? So, you know. And why am I sending it to YouTube? Do I expect to have a big audience there? No, I don't. You know, um, if I were streaming live to YouTube, then maybe, but I wouldn't, like, it's, they don't have as good, a, as, uh, effective of tools for this, and they keep making their streaming stuff more and more complicated all the bloody time, and it, you know, so that's part of the reason for the move to Twitch, it's just so much easier to do, right, and, uh, this way people know what they're missing, and if they're interested in this kind of program, then they can follow me here, right, and they know what's going on, and, then they can do it live, which is much more fun when you're doing something like this with word sprints and discussion, right? So, um, Trunded Hero says, as I develop the culture, I will be changing it, but Sasha Alexander is a good default. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. It's a great place to start. Excuse me. J.M. Baldwin says, I once wrote a story which has a god-type character, but since they've become accustomed to living a human life, and they rename themselves Ben. When my protagonist meets him and learns his name, she's like, Oh, Ben, how majestic? Yeah, cool, cool, I like that. Yeah, my name is Joe, all right? Yeah. Birdie B says, Twitch is made for streaming, YouTube is scrambling to catch up, but keeps stubbing their toes. <clears throat> YouTube's problem is that they are a corporate, uh, um, a corporate hell. Right? And uh, they keep changing things for the sake of changing things every time they hire a new project manager who's like, oh, you got to keep it new and interesting so people will stay engaged. And so they break perfectly good systems that work just fine and screw it up so that everybody else has to play catch up. And sorry, you're going to lose me. I mean, like, you know, maybe they don't care. I don't have enough viewers that they care. I have like maybe almost 3,000 subscribers now and I've been on YouTube for nine years, right? I'm not really trying to build a channel there. I'm not trying to make a lot of money at it that, you know, it's, I'm doing it because I want to get word out about my writing. Ultimately, that's why I'm doing it. So, you know, I, I don't care. And maybe they don't care if they lose me because they've got people who get, you know, 10 million views a video and those are the ones they're trying to keep, right? And I think it's a mistake. I've seen um, music streaming services go this way. And yeah, hopefully Twitch will continue to remain friendly and accessible for small time people like me for a long time, right? Eventually maybe I'll be a big time person and then it'll have been worth it for them to have invested the time in me, right? Yeah. Yeah, Birdie B agrees with me that too about the corporate, uh, corporate hell, right? And uh, 3K isn't bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's it's not bad. I'm pretty happy with it. It's enough that I qualify for a YouTube partner. I've had enough views for that, but I'm not a big partner, and they do not care about the likes of me, you know. So, eh, whatever. Trended Hero says, I'm having trouble with the scene in the mind of the King Emperor being dressed. Would he be dressed by servants? His hair done up? I don't know. Uh, if you are basing it on the late period czars, I would say yes. Because they tended to have a lot of personal servants do a lot of things for them. But if you're doing it more like a, you know... Uh, I mean, like, if this was the Golden Age, right, the tail end of the Golden Age is who the Tsars really represented there, and it was a decadent culture, right? So that was part of the problem, was a big disconnect between, well, you know this, why am I telling you? You're, you're a historian, you probably know this better than I do, but, 
you know, I mean, like, I would think that they probably had that based on the fact that there was so much decadence at that time for especially the ruling class. But, I mean, like, maybe you don't want your culture to work that way. I mean, is it Russia? If it's not Russia, you don't have to be worried about being that accurate, right? So, yeah. Birdie B says, YouTube shift towards money makers and away from the small creators that made the platform is going to doom them. When recommended is nothing but late night talk shows and new music videos, it might as well be cable and not the community it started as. I personally agree with you. Right, I do. So, I mean, I don't know if it's going to doom them, though. Maybe it won't, right? It just won't be what it started out as, right? And, you know, I don't know, right? I, I, I've, I keep saying the things like this when I see this corporate shift, like, okay, way back when, right? Napster and mp3.com were making my music career, right? I was a serious musician for a while, and... I, you know, we were starting to get somewhere on the, like, I, we had, like, the number two song on the goth rock charts at mp3.com for, like, a month or six weeks, something like that, right? So we were just starting to get attention, and then that's when, you know, the whole Napster suit happened, right? Which was well on its way to making my career as a filk writer. People would look for um, songs, right, with dragon in the title, right? And they would find my stuff. And then they would check out my stuff. I got mistaken as a couple of famous filk singers for a while. And then when people found out it was me, right, and that was this person named Sable, right, they were starting to, like, I, I was getting an audience. And then the whole suit thing happened, and they decided not to, you know, that they would cater to the labels instead of to the independent creators who were on there and you couldn't get any like the algorithms changed so couldn't find your stuff anymore right and then uh, mp3.com went the same route at the same time and they decided to try to get you know label bands in there instead of independent creators and they phased us out basically they just didn't want us there anymore right so now I put my music up on Bandcamp and I record a new album once every 10 years if I feel like it and occasionally I sell a song or two, right? Because it's just the market isn't there, right? Okay, Jan Baldwin says, um, I can imagine them being dressed by servants. A lot of clothing for royalty is quite out there and might take assistance to be dressed in, but I know nothing about the culture you're writing about, so I could be way off. I'm just thinking for a normal person's brain, or from a normal person's brain. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, True Undead Hero clarifies, I am doing this mainly around the 1850s to 1900s, so yeah, the tail end of the Russian Empire, but in a fantasy world. The Empire is known as the Drusk Empire, or the Grand Empire of Drusk. I think that's excellent. Birdie B says, YouTube will keep going so long as it's propped up by the alphabet company Google. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the national government is making a go at breaking Google up. Okay, at the risk of getting on a soapbox, I think that the antitrust rules that have existed on the books have been ignored for far too long in the cases of a lot of these companies, right? And I think it is high time that governments and international trade organizations cut them all down to size. Yeah, I think it's well beyond time that that occurred. So, yeah. We'll see what happens over the next four years. I don't have a lot of hope in that department at the moment, but it'll happen. It's coming. You can only keep the pitchforks at the door so long. Okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. I can still like you if you're an honest conservative. I can, right? We may not agree on the solution, but that's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, I, but I don't like bullies. Either way, we're not friends if you're a bully, right? So. Okay. Enough about my personal nonsense. Does anybody have any other questions or comments before we start into another sprint? 
I think this time I'd like to go for about half an hour, let's say. Well, no, 20 minutes. We'll do 20 minutes because that'll take us to the hour. What do you guys think? <laughs> Birdie B says streaming is all about your personal nonsense. Okay, fair enough. Uh, don't tempt me. I just might get a, like, uh, two shows I've been considering doing that I was originally considering doing for YouTube, but I might just do as live streams. One is, uh, you know, my political ranting. <laughs> and then the other one would be something which I'm calling nerd rage in my head. Right, where I do things like complain about the Disney adaptation of the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs John Carter novels and, you know, go off about the movie Starship Troopers. That kind of thing. I don't know if anybody has any interest in that. <laughs> but that's tempting. Anyway. Okay. Trinid Hero says, The Empire of Drusk is also based heavily off Russia in the sense that around this time, the Empire of Drusk is shifting into, or in the sense that the nation is ramping up industry and modernizing, but is keeping the same traditional feudalistic government. Yeah, that has limited effectiveness, doesn't it? I turned down this music just a little bit. I feel like I'm yelling a bit. Okay. Um... He says, because of this, Drusk is a boiling pot looking for a strong but noble leader, but the leader it's got is a young and easy manipulated man who questions whether he is even fit to rule at all. Yeah. Jan Baldwin says, I should be able to finish the chapter I'm outlining in 20 minutes, so I'm in. Broken Jack says, 20 is hopefully long enough to finish one or two sections. Yeah, I know what you mean. It takes longer, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Birdie B says, I keep finding myself self-indulgent, but streaming is self-indulgent. I wrote this thing really good. <laughs> yeah, or myself saying. Sorry, yeah. I keep finding myself saying, self-indulgent, but streaming is self-indulgent. I wrote this thing really good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, you bet. Well, if you're entertaining people, that's good. I may at some point start reading stories on, uh, on this thing as well. Story Girl says, I write good. <laughs> w R Y T G U D. Orc spelling. All right. No. <laughs> that's in my universe, that's because of lack of education, not because they're stupid. So that's a thing. But yeah. Cool. All right. Let's go for 20. Jam Bulb. Oh. <laughs> Aaron Reese says, I write gooder than you. <laughs> I write uh, W R I T gooder, G U D D E R, than you like a sheep. Awesome. Sure. <laughs> okay. Jam Baldwin says, I sometimes wish I could get into YouTube simply for the writing author tube community on there, but I can't talk to a camera. So, <sighs> I feel you there, right? Um,. Have a script. Have cue cards. Right? That's how I got started. You know? Twitch is kind of made for random... Or, or start with Twitch, because nobody seems to mind if you ramble randomly on this thing. So, you know, that's cool. I can get behind that. <laughs> sure on it here says, I write bestest. I, um, R-I-G-H-T, B and, and bestest. Right? So. Hey. Um, when I was, don't, don't, don't be pointing too much fun at that bestest though, right? When I was a kid and in school, they taught me that one did not say stupider and stupidest, right? One wrote more stupid, right? But now apparently that's what you do. And so, this changed sometime during the years that I would have been in university had I gone to university and nobody bothered to inform me, right? Um... I would like to point out that, you know, I'm 45 years old, right? And um, people do not inform people in my age group sometimes that things have, been, have changed, right? They just rip you up on like social media or whatever, right? And you're like, nobody told me, you know? So maybe keep that in mind. If you're younger than that, you're talking to us old people, okay? Right. Um. Story Girl says, <laughs> You do not. 
<laughs> my rights are ungreetable. Ungreetable? Yeah. <laughs> Un Ungreetable. That's great. That's hilarious. Solar Cat. Oh, hello, Solar Cat. Nice to see you. Says, I hate those rule changes. So do I. It's not bloody fair. You know? Just, like, give me the memo and I'll adapt, right? Okay. Um. <laughs> Drew Undead Hero says, interesting fact, actually. <laughs> interesting fact, actually. I don't know if you're being sarcastic there. You know, about the well actually people. Mm, mm hmm. Yeah, okay. Birdie B says, I've been streaming my editing without a camera. No one needs to see my face as I babble into the microphone. Babbling, I would have been doing anyway. <sighs> okay, why am I putting my face on the camera? Because, um, because someone told me that people feel more connected to you if they can see your face. Right? So if you're, you know, trying to reach out to people, they connect with you better. You build an audience better because you build a relationship because people can see your sincerity and whatnot, right? Or, you know, your amusement or whatever it is. And they feel like they getting to know you. And when you're doing this kind of babble, you're definitely getting to know me. This is me. I'm not putting on a show here. This is <laughs> what I'm like. Right? Um, I may be a lot quieter when you see me because I may be more focused on what I'm writing, but otherwise, right? Uh, get a, get a, like a, an alcohol, you know, get, get like a cooler and a half in me and this is what I'm like, but, um, so that's, that's why I do the face thing, right? But I don't do everything that way. I do a podcast. You don't need to see my face. I do interviews. You don't need to see my face. I do, when we do our role-playing game, right, which we stream on Saturdays, although that may be changing to Mondays in the next couple of weeks, that's an update I should give, right? Um, I We don't put our faces on camera because, <clears throat> well, one of the reasons is that one of our players has satellite internet, so she, you know, would just eat all her data. If she lives in the boonies, right? And it would just eat all her data if she did, we did everything on video. But the other reason is because it doesn't matter what I look like. You should be thinking about what my character looks like and trying to imagine the scenario, right? So, but yeah, I feel ya. I'm an introvert too. I do okay when I have a set of rules about what's expected of me, right? <clears throat> so I, I get ya, right? And I've actually, I remember that about you because I've tuned in to at least one of your streams because I have followed you and I think you might be on my host list. And if I have done that, then that means that I have checked out what you do and determined that I think that's something I want to support with my channel, right? I'm pretty careful about that. So, you know, yeah. And that's fine. Actually, you're entertaining. So it's cool. Yeah, Solar Cat says, double spaces after periods was what I learned. Uh-huh, right? Okay, I only learned to change when I tried to submit a trophy guide for a game. You know what? That's that's the thing, right? And you're like, look, just give me the damn submission guidelines, right? And I promise you I will delete the extra space after the period if that's what you want, right? If you're not going to tell me to do that, you're going to get it the way I typed it. Dealwithit.com, right? You know, and everyone's like, but everyone does it that way. No, they don't, honey. No, they don't. Let me tell you something, right? Um, there are magazines out there that are still accepting paper submissions that have been around a lot longer than you've been alive, right? That are still doing it that way. So don't assume. Yeah, I, I, I may be a little bitter about this. Didn't realize it. Solar Cat said hi back. <laughs> hi back. Yeah. Uh, Broken Jack said, I don't like those newer words and I am in high school. Right? Stupider. It sounds stupider to me. Ah, okay. All right. True Undead Hero says, if you read stuff from the older books like The Great Gatsby, you will notice that the word literally is thrown around a lot in a figurative. In, in a figuratively. I think he meant figurative sense. Right? Because literally was used in a sense of creating mysticism. Yeah, the words, the meanings of words do change. And that is something to keep in mind when you're reading older literature, which I do a lot. And it's even changed from like the 1960s in some senses. 
right? So yeah, just it's it's an interesting point. And to some degree, a writer does have an obligation, I think, to be aware of how the language has changed. Because, well, I would say that the most important skill of an English language writer is to pick the right word with the right connotation. Because there are seven words at least for everything you want to say. Which one conveys the meaning you're trying to convey? Right? And I don't always succeed at that, I think. Right? It's something that I work on. Birdie B says that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Story Girl said that's true, even if you just have a camera box down in the bottom of your screen and referring to the, you know, I guess, yeah, they were both referring to the people connect with you better if they see your face. Yeah, I think they do. Yeah. Um, True Undead Hero says, but in the 70s and 80s, literally was changed to be, well, literal. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Story Girl says, facial expressions do a lot towards bonding with an audience. I agree with that, right? I think that I like to know, you know, how you feel about things as well as what you're saying, right? And that's, I don't have to, right? Like, you know, I'll pick up the nuances in your voice after a while once I've learned how to talk, but it, or how you talk, right? But it'll be easier if I can see what you look like. Yeah. A story girl asks, do I stream this RPG? Yes, I do. It's called The Toy Soldiers Old School. It's based in the uh, universe of this book that I'm writing right now. And it is uh, in the Pathfinder tabletop RPG system, first edition. And we've been streaming it on Saturday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific time. It runs for three hours. Right. Um, we may be changing it to Mondays in the next couple of weeks, though, because people's schedules have changed now that the quarantine is coming to an end in a lot of places. So, yeah, I'm happy to report that um, in BC, we're doing pretty well. We have uh, we had our first no death day since the outbreak yesterday and our cases have consistently like the new cases have consistently been in the single digits and we've only got like partial reopening right now with you know limits on how many people you can have in places and you know recommendations to wear masks in doors and stuff like that my i'm very proud of my local government i think they've done a very good job so yeah Solar Cat says, literally, now means figuratively again. I know. And actually, that's tr that's official, right? Uh, I think Oxford changed it. They, they said that literally can also be used to mean figuratively. I think they may have said informal. You know how they put the brackets with informal in the meaning, but it's actually dictionary meaning. Not till I die, honey. That's not happening in my world. When I say literally, I mean literally. <laughs> But language changes, and obviously my kids do not feel that way. They use it that way all the time. So, and Aaron Re honest, uh, thankfully uh, answered the question because he's trying to help out Saturdays at eighteen hundred PST because he is our DM. So he is awesome. Birdie B says, "Me, fantastic! Thank you. Well, of course, you gotta support each other, right? We're all in this together." You know, Story Girl says, nice. Unfortunately, I'm usually streaming a Star Trek Adventures game on Saturdays at that time. Yeah, and uh, like he said, that could be changing to Mondays. <coughs> Excuse me. A Solar Cat says, yes, in the dictionary. So now literally is both a synonym and antonym of figuratively. I know, it's ironic, isn't it? A Toronto Dead Hero says, you're awesome, Sable. Woot woot. Well, thank you. I'm, I think you're pretty awesome, too. Okay. We're at almost 3 o'clock. And I've done a lot more talking than writing today. You guys want to do some more writing? Or do we have more to chat about? Either way, I'm cool. But... No, no, no. Label out. <laughs> Gotta get that brand deal. <laughs> oh, this, this, uh, the cup. Or is it the, you know, pop that shall not be named? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I don't know. The cup. I have had this cup since I was 10 years old. It was a gift from my best friend for my birthday. It has lasted through uh, two relations, no, three relationships. Uh, 20 to 50, no, 12 to 15 moves, being thrown against a wall, being dropped from a deck. Um, so it's like my lucky cup, right? Yeah, yeah, the soda, says Turundan Hero. Yeah, sorry. Next time, I will make sure to, you know, cover it. So, wait, there we go. Cover it. There you go, it's a red can. That's all you know. Okay. Uh, Jam Ballroom says, that cup brings back good memories. I would say Smurf for swears up until I was 15 and nobody could tell me off for it. That wasn't that useful. That was a very handy tactic. <laughs> yeah, I did that too. All right. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get writing. You guys cool with that? Let's do some writing. What do you figure here? It's five minutes to three o'clock by my clock. So... I say let's go for the big half hour sprint right now. And then that way we can be back at 3.30. And then that gives us, uh, you know, several more minutes to do that. Okay, bye honey. Yeah, he says he's off to watch the Young Turks, which is what we usually do at 3 o'clock when I'm not streaming. So, all right. Half an hour and I'll, you know, let you know how it goes. Did it capture that properly yes okay good we're good and we begin
Okay, one sec. We're five minutes into the spring.
One minute left to the sprint. That's time. All right. So I guess I'll put my asterisk here and go back to my last actor. Asterisk. I feel like I was a bit more in the groove this time, starting to get back into the rhythm of things. Not bad, 508 words. Still not my best, but pretty good. All right. Other totals. Story Girl did 655, good job. Right, True Undead Hero said 647, I hate you. I say that every time. He, he's like this massively fast writer. It just impresses the heck out of me. That, and uh, Broken Jack says that was about perfect, as I have few touch, a few touch-ups to make before publishing my article. 732. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. That's amazing. All right, let's see what I missed while I was gone. All right, so before I went, I guess I missed that Birdie B said, no writing, who likes to write anyway? Good point. We would rather procrastinate and waste a bunch of time because we are writers and that's how we do. I don't know, terrible. Uh, Turunded Hero says, the whole country and its people are yours to command. You must remember that. The nation is a tool, Alexander, one that you must wield. Advice of the marshal to his king. Yep, <clears throat> or emperor rather. Hmm, I don't know why, but I keep picturing Milos with one arm. Why not? Why why might he not have one arm? That's your uh, marshal, right? I mean, it's not like warrioring is a safe profession, ever has been in history, or ever will be, right? It's like, you know, it's always been somewhat risky, so... And actually, the time period, I mean... Remember that's, uh, you know, when, like, it, yeah, I mean, sure, that's a perfectly reasonable injury, and people just kept right on fighting, you know? Nelson didn't predate that time by, you know, that much, so, right? Drunded Hero says, now I am currently questioning what the family thinks of Alexander. Has he always been a disappointment? Um, you know... Maybe. I mean, like, there's a reason why he lacks confidence, right? Perhaps his father was an abusive bully who constantly undermined him and said, don't be stupid, and, you know, this and that expected perfection all the time, and he wasn't, you know, nobody's capable of perfection, right? Um, yeah. The movie The King's Speech came to mind that, you know, Maybe you could check that out to get an inspiration for their relationship. That was an excellent movie, by the way. Really enjoyed it. Story Girl wanted to know what the time was. I'm sorry, I guess I wasn't clear I said half an hour, but that's all right, because Broken Jack uh, helped me out. Maybe I got cut off or something. Uh, Trended Hero said, I am hitting a brick wall with this, but I got a good 400 more words. Well, that's great. It's a good start. Yeah, I'm happy with this right now. Be right back, gonna walk the dog. Awesome. 
Oh, hey, Spambot! All right, I love Spambots, because you know why? Because I get to tell them to piss off and die. It's great. Let's see here. Block, block, blockity, block, blockity, block, 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 block. Blockity, blockity, block, and bam. Goodbye. Because first offense. Yep. That was a terrible whistle. Oh, dry, dry mouth. <laughs> Trundad Hero says, Birdie, what tools do you use to get a better image in your head? I always find myself struggling with non-action scenes. Birdie says, close my eyes and think about it. That's about it. He's lucky. But that's cool. Trundad Hero says, I'm also struggling with describing the architecture. Like, I can picture it really well, but struggling with words. Okay, so the way to fix that is read some stuff on, like, a beginner's guide to architecture. Right? And then you have an idea of what the terminology is that you're trying to use right um maybe brush yourself up on the history of uh, like I, I often start with wikipedia because then i know what i don't know right and i can further research from there obviously you know you say i start with wikipedia you know what wikipedia is almost 99 percent of the time just fine for a writer trying to get a picture for a fictional image and if it isn't, then it's got, you know, what you do is you go down and you check the sources that they got the information from if you're trying to do better research than that, right? And then you go to those sources, right? And you vet them from there, right? So, I mean, that's a good starting point. If you're trying to get the cliff notes, right, it can often be really helpful. So, I find, personally. I'm old enough to remember the days when we used to have to actually, like, go to the library, right? go through their catalog, uh, look for a book based on title and um, a library of Congress or uh, Canadian library data, right? Whether or not it might actually work for what we're trying to do with it. Request it, right? Wait for it to arrive. Go check it out. See if it actually was what we needed. Right? And then we might have the information we require to continue with our research for the book. Right? Google is so much easier. Sorry, just is. It wins. Right? Um, Birdie B goes on to say, Sometimes I'll describe a small detail that I know and work from there. That's an excellent way to do it. If I don't know what's going on, I stop and think about the story before and where I want it to go, then I figure out what needs to go in the middle. Story Girl said, wow, not bad, the 732 that is. Yeah, I know, right? That's impressive. Ha! Huh. My short story is ready for another run by my editor, says Birdie B. Time to walk my turtle. Walk your turtle? You walk your turtle? Are you being sarcastic or is that serious? Because if that's serious, that is cool. All right. Story Girl says, I'm writing a dialogue and reaction rich scene. I know the characters pretty well, which makes channeling the words and responses onto the page pretty efficient. True Undead Hero, have you considered sketching the architecture or locating some reference photos that might help? Yeah, I find that helps too. All right. Um... But, yeah, you don't want to do that in the middle of a writing sprint, right? So when you're doing a writing sprint, you'd write, you know, uh, describe big pillar here. Describe gargoyle here, you know? There's, unless it's NaNoWriMo where you're trying to actually, like, pad your word count, right? You don't, uh, you don't need a lot of detail. As a matter of fact, someone very good, uh, I got a very good piece of advice somewhere from somebody that was... Take three major details and describe them, right? Then it's like you give a, a realistic snapshot of the scene that you're trying to create, right? Unless you're treating your setting like a character, because you can do that, right? Westerns are very good with that, and it's a technique I use a lot in my Weird West tales, because um, the Weird West, is, I mean, like, the, 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 the land is foreboding, right? It's beautiful and it's dangerous. 
And it's always supposed to be like that because it's unknown, it's mysterious, right? It might kill you just as easily as any of the trouble you could run into with various uh, antagonists and whatnot, right? So if you give the, you know, treat the, the landscape like a character and it expresses itself and its moods by description and weather, right? Then you can spend a fair bit of time on that and really enjoy it and it serves a purpose to your story. But otherwise, if you're just trying to create, okay, they're in a room, they're in a building, they're in a castle, whatever, pick three major uh, features and describe them, right? And then people will feel like they know it without you having spent 10 pages on an info dump, right? So that's another suggestion I got. Now, it works for me because I can be uh, known to do that, right? I picture my worlds like a full sensory experience Right, um, I dream in vivid color. I didn't realize that people didn't normally get colors and smells in their dreams until I read a book on it. Right, so um, for me, it just kind of you know I I get like I get things like what the air smells like, what the what the architecture looks like. That's another thing. If I might make that suggestion, um, try not to limit your information to visual information. Right, what does a castle smell like? You know. Does it smell like moldering old tapestries, right? And that, that you know, or, or does it smell like uh, hot stone that's being, you know, warmed in the sun, right? Like you can communicate a lot about your theme by communicating the mood of the surroundings. So that may be something that you want to consider since I know that your theme is kind of like, you know, confrontation of what it me what power means. Right, I would want to make the castle beautiful and imposing, and you know, a lot of it would remain unused. Right now, that's uh, historically accurate, but it's also um, a good way to indicate that there are areas in the castle that even the Tsar dares not touch, right? Because you know, when one is powerful, one must step carefully, right? So. Broken Jack says, it's so hard to come up with good quotes, which isn't helpful when I make heavy use of them in my design. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. What I do for my World Anvil articles is, like, I, I think I end up getting uh, docked points in this when it comes to contests and whatnot but I leave my quotes for my books, right? Like whenever there's a quote, it's a, it's a, sub, the subject is something that I have described in my book and I'm putting it in there, whether the book's published or not yet is irrelevant, right? But I, I put that quote in there to give you a feel of what it looks like in prose, right? I don't use quotes from uh, the, you know, some made up character who's illustrating what's going on because I've taken sort of a wiki tone with the way in which I've written my information articles, right? So um, I don't always have quotes that are relevant, right? Um, because I may not have written about that part yet. Or if I have, it might be a spoiler and I don't want to put it in there except for maybe certain subscriber groups, right? So um, I did happen to have some quotes for this one though, the um, history challenge article that I'm working on. So which I did not stream on Sunday because I was drawing that, the art. So, because I wanted it for the article. So, Birdie B says, that's my favorite part of spam bots too, doesn't it? I know, right? You're like, ha ha, die! <laughs> and it's like, you're getting, uh, you know, revenge for all the spam you've ever been sent in your email and all the, the spam you've ever been sent in your mailbox and all that stuff. You're like, die, I hate you. It's great. It's fun. Hey, author goddess, how you doing? Glad you could join us. Welcome. Yay. Story Girl says, I love the trolls. As a trans streamer, I get some real weirdos in. I bet you do. Holy, you know, people, why people are such assholes? I just don't know. I don't know. 
right? Determined to misgender me. Yeah, like that's going to make you change your mind or change your decisions about your life in any way, right? You know, just come and be an asshole for the sake of being. I don't know why people bother, really. You know, when they do, I just walk them through the process of cutting and pasting their crap into a report and then announcing the upcoming block and ban. That's right. Goodbye. Don't even waste your time. I'm... I'm, uh, I approve all comments on my YouTube channel. The reason why I do that is because I'm a Wiccan and I do a lot of Wiccan related content. My first published book was a, uh, uh mid-level published, uh, publisher, um, how-to on witchcraft and it's called, uh, the, the Witch's Eight Paths of Power, right? So, um, I get born-again Christians telling me I'm going to hell, misogynist jerks, trying to, uh, you know, shut down any woman who dares to open her mouth, right? Um, Anti-LGBTQ people because I'm openly bisexual, right? Like, you know, and I just, I don't, I don't deal with it. So I just approve all comments. And I find actually that um, probably about 99% of that kind of garbage I never see. Right? I don't see it because people don't waste their time. If I'm, if I'm approving all comments anyway, what are you going to, you know, actually accomplish by sending that to me? You know? So, by the way, I got nothing against born-again Christians. I do have things against born-again Christians who come to my church where I am teaching my faith and tell me that I am going to hell. You know what? Go to hell. Get there. Get out of my face. I don't come to your church and start casting spells and chanting hymns to the goddess. Now do I? So you can stay out of my room and I will stay out of yours, right? But, you know, that, yeah. So, yeah, it's just, and I do that with my blogs, like my professional blogs and whatnot, because there's just no need to be rude to each other, you know? And I just won't, I won't have it, right? I won't have it. So, the trolls... I, I just, I haven't had any real trolls yet, but I'll take the same attitude with them. I got no patience for it. Okay, Turunded Hero says, I'm also really sorry for asking random questions. If I type it out, it becomes more real than if I just say it. No, that's what we're here for, man. Right? We're, we're here to help each other out and work and write together. I don't mind. I really. And I don't think anybody else does either. I think they're happy to help you out. You know, there's a lot of people here who've been writing for a while because, you know, like, I you know, accidentally discovered this amazing writer's uh, community here on Twitch. I think it's great. And uh, yeah, you know, like my advice is one person's advice and it may not work for everybody. And the more perspectives you can have, the better. And I think everybody, I, I know I personally really like helping out newer writers. Like I just love it because I get so much joy out of it. And it was so important for me to find my voice, right? So I want to help other people find their voices too. So I got time. It's cool. J.M. Baldwin says, There's a set of books by Angela Ackerman that I use when I struggle to describe things. I've heard about this, actually, right? She has books on describing emotions and how a character might look or act, but also places like urban and rural settings, what they'd look like, that they'd that they uh, smell like, I think he said smell like, but I think he meant smell like, etc. It really helps with getting a good idea of a setting with all the senses. That's great, yeah. Um, yeah, I, what is it called? The Emotions Dictionary or something like that, right? I've heard about this. Um, I took a seminar actually with her at um, the When Words Collide conference in Calgary last year. And I thought she had a lot of really great things to say, right? I keep meaning to get the book. I'm I'm not bad at this, actually. I'm I'm pretty good at describing things with all their senses, right? All my reviews say, "Oh, your world building is so great." Okay, I don't know, right? But that's what they say, and it's partly because I describe things with all the senses, and I know it, right? So, um, because I work on that, right? Um, but you can always learn new things, right? And I end up falling into a pattern sometimes that I try to get on the second or third edit where I'm repeating the same catchphrases with that kind of thing. And I don't think that helps anybody. So I, yeah, I want to get it. And she was really good. She had a lot of good things to say. Okay. Birdie B says, no, I've actually got a tortoise. I take him outside and we roam around the yard. That is freaking awesome. 
What is your tortoise's name? That is so cool. I love tortoises. I think they're amazing. I, I'm a big reptiles fan, actually. I like them a lot. I don't think I know a reptile I don't like. So, I'd love to know more. Uh, yeah, Jam Baldwin corrected the smell, so I was... Yeah. And the story girl says, yeah, don't do a Mervyn Peak redescriptions. Yes. Do not go on and on and on and on and on. Okay. Jam Baldwin says, there's a more that is a major setting in my current work in progress, and it's for sure its own character in a way. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool, right? Um, so yeah, you know, give it, uh, when, when you're describing it, well, you probably know this already. I know you stream writing too, but you know, give it, uh, give it like a sense of, I don't know, whatever it is. If you, if it's hostile menace, you know, describe things like the sinister gurgle of the bog and stuff, right? You can do that. And I'm, I'm telling you this, not because I'm telling you this per se, but because I'm illustrating it for anybody else who might be listening, right? Um, there's a lot of wind on my, uh, prairies in my Weird West story, and it changes tone depending on the mood, right? I kind of picture it like a, I mean, I, I realize it's kind of a gender stereotype, but it's a piece of land and it doesn't matter, right? So it's like a, a capricious woman, right? And sometimes she's like, come here i'm you know i'm i'm open and i'm i'm welcoming you and sometimes she's like no stay away and sometimes she's like you know what i don't like you and i'm gonna make your life miserable you know she's moody right so the wind says a lot about kind of the theme and tone that i'm going for at the time and there a lot of other things too the way the grass grows what season it is you know i i try to do that right so yeah baldwin says ugh i can't type for today it's fine nobody cares about extra apostrophes in chat right like or on social media nobody cares okay so uh not even writers right because yeah we care about it in the manuscript we don't care about it here yeah i don't anyway story girl says or citrus oil lamps etc oh yes uh-huh uh-huh yeah okay broken jack says it's been fun but i've got to dip now well thank you for joining me have fun and uh maybe i'll see you next week i do this every wednesday from 1 to 4 p.m uh pacific time so Uh, Danny Adventures, hello, thank you for joining me, right, says, yes, the thesauruses. Uh, Jane Baldwin says, yeah, they're the thesauruses are so handy, right, so I, yeah, the emotional thesaurus, is that what I was after? Not the emotional dictionary, but the emotional thesaurus, cool, or the emotions thesaurus, maybe that's, yeah, that's it. Right, yeah, I've heard about this. Lots of people swear by it. It's supposed to be amazing. I keep meaning to get a copy. Jam Baldwin says, Amour is a main setting in my novel, but I've never actually been in one. Uh, her book on urban settings actually helped me to understand what it would smell life it's like, what plant life would be there, whether it be... Or yeah, if he meant rural settings, yeah. What what plant what it would smell like, what plant life would be there, whether it would be cold, etc. Cool. I'm gonna have to look for that book. I've been a lot of different landscape places because I like, you know, I climb things and I explore stuff. But you know, you can always learn more things. There are places that I've never been. I've never been to the Everglades, you know? What are the Everglades like? You know, I've only ever seen it on TV. It looks like it would smell like green rotting things. And probably there would be hints of really perfumey flowers, I would think, on the wind, right? And, but I don't know, you know? Is the water actually green? Is it murky? Is it you know, reflective in places because it's so murky and dark, you know? What does it sound like? I, I had a CD that I got that was Sounds of the Everglades, and I discovered there are these things called pig frogs. This is the type of stuff that you need to get to a setting to learn, right? Pig frogs 
are called pig frogs because they sound like pigs grunting, right? That's what they sound like. And it, it's something that I never would have imagined or described in an Everglades scene. But the people of the Everglades will know I have not been there if I do not describe it because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff can be really helpful. All right. <laughs> Birdie B says his name is Senor uh, Sheldon Bubbles Tortuga the Third. That is awesome. That is cool. Right on. So awesome. I want to. I want to like pat his head. It's cool. Yeah. Or is it like pat his head? Is he like a big tortoise? That's cool. Okay. Trended Hero says I guess one thing I'm curious. I'm uh, curiously worried about is that since I base a lot of my writing off actual events, I'm afraid that I will copy paste the event without changing any details other than names. Okay, so um, uh, there's two. Uh, okay, I, I have two minds about this. One is so what, right? Um, many fantasy writers who have made a lot bigger name for themselves than you have done this, right? The uh, conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters is the same thing as the conflict between the Yorks and the Lancasters, right? And it is the War of the Roses with a little bit of Tudor history tossed in at the end. And that's what it is. I mean, like, it's pretty lifted. The difference is... Um, oh, yeah, and uh, that... Uh, Okay, uh, the two towers, right, where they're at, uh, where are they? Um, my Tolkien nerd thing is going away. My brain is not doing names today. I didn't sleep very well last night. It's the first thing to go. All right, but, um, you know, when, when the, the great charge is over the mountain, they're, like, defending... It is not Minas Tirith that I am thinking of. Minas Tirith is something else. It is... Well, okay, they're... You know, they're... they're they've been exiled to the Stone Fortress, you know, and they're waiting to see, right, if, uh, you know, they're going to survive the night. There's this great big orc horde that they're fighting, and then the big charge right over the hill at dawn. That's a real historical event. Uh, I think it was a Danish king, but don't quote me on that. And there was a, uh, you know, this big siege. I don't know. I used to remember. I had a point when I started this particular line of discussion, but I don't remember anything today. So, but the point is it was drawn right from history too. It was not made up and writers do that all the time. On the other hand, if you're going to have things unfold according to the way things did historically, then you have to consider whether or not the fantastical elements that you're introducing would change the course of history. I mean, you know, is uh, magic just technology under a different name in your universe? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's basically what the deal is in the Toy Soldier Saga. It's pretty much just technology under a different name, right? So, um... But it works differently. It has its own laws, right? So that's, uh, you know, but would it change things, right? Well, for one thing, if you have magic that can um, hold air to your ship when you go out into space, then you're, and, and you also have magic that can make your ships fly, then you're going to explore space a lot earlier, right? Which is obviously what happened in my universe. But, I mean, that's kind of the setup. But then, you know, think about it from there. Like, one of the things that I'm doing in the course of the story is that there's a bit of an arms race going on, right? And, um, the elves are the British Navy, right? And they rule the waves. And then all of a sudden somebody builds the Bismarck, right? That's like literally what happens, right? Only I call it the vengeance, right? And, uh, they're all of a sudden they're like, well, shit, we better catch up here, right? And all of a sudden all their technology is obsolete. Like when the orcs show up, they have cannons and the 
elves are still using magically enchanted siege weaponry, ballista and catapults, right? So they really have to adapt to find a way to deal with that because they're just getting their asses handed to them, right? And I mean, like that's stolen from history too, right? Ultimately, the uh, British Navy had a really hard time catching up and eventually I think you know, they were unable to, like, they were always playing scramble after that point, and eventually the, the U.S. Navy surpassed them, right, as kind of rulers of the waves, right, which the Chinese are currently challenging, and I'm not sure I disagree with, I mean, like, I, I disagree with their policy of, yes, we owned it 5,000 years ago, so now we're going to, re no, okay, look, anyway, but that's all politics, too. But the point is, like, you know, it's a, a matter of how would that have affected the way things have unfolded. And as long as you're keeping that in mind, I don't think there's any real problem with stealing from literal history, you know? Uh, J.M. Baldwin says, giving places and whether human characteristics is called pathetic fallacy. Am I right? Or am I getting that mixed up? I have not heard that term. I thought it was, uh, I mean, like, if so, they taught it in a writing class I did not take. But it might be because I don't have... Like, I didn't uh, pursue writing academically after I left high school. And the reason why is because I had... Well, two reasons. One is I had a odd experience with my writing English and English teacher in high school, right? And the other is that there was really nothing creative here at the time. I would have had to go you know, out of town, and I was like, well, you know, I mean, I don't want to teach writing, I want to write, so, and there didn't seem to be any careers for creative writers once you had left university at the time, now, granted this is early 90s, right, except for teaching, right, and I knew I didn't want to do that, so, so, I mean, it might be called that, I, I would call it uh, um, personification myself, but, you know, that's possibly not the right term either. And Story Girl says hi to Danny, which is cool. J.M. Baldwin says, I live in England, so it's not like there's a shortage of moors here. I just don't really have the people to go with me. And I have this irrational fear of accidentally stepping onto someone's private property. That's probably a reasonable concern, right? Um... Yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, hmm, I don't know what I would do with that. I know that, I mean, I, I suppose if you dedicated yourself to a, an aggressive Google search, you could probably find out, but you'd have to have a bit of Google foo with that, like, um, Moore's open to the public right and see what happens from there or you know moors that uh, are tourist attractions or something i don't know but the, if you go to one of those tourist attractions are you really getting the feel of it right so yeah I'm, let me think on that one let me think on that one i'll see if i can i know uh you know i'll ask my writer friends if they've got any idea because i know lots of writers by now right by the way what the hell time is it in the UK right now so that's you know because I know I never get to talk to the UK people on the World Anvil server at this time of day usually so are you like a really late night no wait no you were walking your no okay wrong person all right Helm's Deep thank you that's what I was looking for okay see on the tip of my tongue but you know this wouldn't come today Birdie B says he's a small turtle the size of a large potato. Oh, I just a baby. Oh, that's great. So cool. You're lucky. I am jealous. Yeah. Story Girl suggested Minas Tirith. Author Goddess said Helm Steep. Yes. Yeah, and then said, oh, Gondor or Helm Steep. Yeah. Yeah, that was what I was looking for. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Story Girl said Shinara is similar. I think that may have been.
been in response to my description of the Weird West, right? Okay. Author Goddess says, and it's anthropomorphism to give non-living or non-sentient things human characteristics. Thank you. She's smart. Thank you for being smart today when I am having a stupid day. I appreciate that. I guess that is helpful. Okay. Oh, and then she adds, but a quick Google says pathetic fallacy is right too. Yeah, pathos. Sure. Neat. Uh, ascribing emotional characteristics to something. Yep. And then Jam Baldwin thanked Author Goddess. Author Goddess said, this gives a nice rundown of the three main vocabs for that concept. Okay, and she provided a link. Thank you, that's very helpful. I will check that out later. Uh, Jane Baldwin says, I think the Yorkshire Moors would probably be my best bet the Moors Wuthering Heights is based on. Yeah, um, I think you're probably right. I know about the Yorkshire Moors from uh, poetry and pagan literature. They're quite romanticized in that uh in in that period right the the pastoral type period which inspired a lot of modern witchcraft so i know about them right so if i know about them they've got to kind of be the quintessential moors right so because i'm over here in canada man and i'm even on the wrong ocean so it's just gone midnight he says yeah i wondered if it was getting late yeah, Story Girl says, just letting you know I'm going to have to head off soon. Thanks for the interesting and productive stream. Well, thank you for coming. You were really, uh, I appreciate you're so active in the chat and getting involved. And, you know, I'm glad we got some writing done together. That's really awesome. It's really good to have you. Oh, it was related to the tech and magic thing. Okay, read the comment about Shannara. You know, I actually haven't read Shannara. Sorry, I know they're going to take away my nerd card, right? Especially my fantasy nerd card, but I haven't. But um, people have made that comparison. So I legit see what you're, you know, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Pacific Ocean equals best ocean, says the story girl. Well, after Southern Ocean. <laughs> yep. Yep. We have some Southern Hemisphere pride going on. Good for you. That's cool. Yeah. Trended Hero says, I normally only use magic as a tool to enhance things that I'll use in my world. Like, right now, mana in my world is a physical thing that humans have that they push into their weapons to change an effect like guns can fire mana enhanced bullets that would cause them to explode or giving blades a fiery effect. Yeah. Oh, you live in Adelaide. Okay. Yeah, I knew you were an Aussie, but uh, I didn't know where, so. Or is that Aussie? Is that New Zealand? I'm, it, I'm turning red now because I'm embarrassed because I don't know. I should know these things. No, it's... You know what? I've got my Google down at the moment, too, because I'm trying not to interfere with my stream by maximizing, like, or minimizing the effect on the memory, but yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. I was right the first time. New Zealand is about 3,000 kilometers to the right. Okay. I just had a moment of self-doubt there. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Well, you know, Aussies and Canadians, we kind of understand each other a, a bit, I think. There's enough cultural similarities that I don't think it takes us much to, you know. So true, she says. I used to uh, do housekeeping for the local ski resort, which is Silver Star Mountain. And um, during the Christmas season, of course, we got a lot of Australian skiers and it was not hard to talk to them and befriend them at all. People would come up from Australia to work the ski resort in the, our winter and then they would go back to Oz to work the ski resorts in their winter, right? And there was a bunch of Canadians who would also do that migration, right? <laughs> Story Girl says, I've met few Canadians I haven't gotten on well with. Well, cool. Yeah, I have yet to dislike an Aussie that I have met. So that's great. Cool. Right? And True Undead Hero says, Canadians are just Northern Australia. 
more like the other way around because technically we were here first just saying my maple leaf pride no, okay 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 oh my gosh we're, we have a lot in common it's a fact yeah we understand each other wow did that ever go fast today guys we are already at five after four. Oh, thank you story girl says p.s especially canadians from bc are very chill and lovely well, that's cool. I'm glad we have that reputation. Thanks. That's great. To be honest, um, I know enough about Australia to recognize the difference between a uh, coastal, urban, and outback accent, but I can't place where. Like, I, I can't tell the difference between Queensland and Western Australian accents. There is a difference. I know there is, right? And the people in Sydney don't talk anything like the people in Adelaide, right? But I don't, uh, you know, but otherwise I can't really pinpoint, right? Because I just, you know, don't get enough of a sample, I guess. But. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to wrap this up here pretty quick. Is there anything else that anyone has to say before we call this a day? You know, comments, questions, story girl nods. I'm thinking of streaming at about 6 p.m. your time tonight. Come check out my accent. You'll probably think it's closer to UK than anything you've heard. You know what? I actually did because I have checked out your stream and I mistakenly thought that you were in the UK. Actually, I apologize for that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know she has a great stream, doesn't she? She's fun. Definitely check her out. I know for a fact that she is on the host list, so you should definitely check out her stream. I did catch the end of one. Yeah, I did too. That's right. Yeah, I'll try to stop in. It probably won't be right at six, but it will be, but I will stop in for sure. Definitely. It might be at six. Eh, maybe it will. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> All right. Oh, Birdie B said I meant your stream. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really did too. I've had a lot of fun. You guys have been great. I thanks for the support and thanks for you know participating in the chat and writing with me and you guys are amazing and I definitely I'm starting to really look forward to Wednesdays. I think they're great. Jan Baldwin says, I get mistaken for Australian whenever I talk to Americans for some reason. That's because Americans don't know the difference between accents that are outside of their own country. <laughs> I love Americans. I do. I tease them. You know, I... Yeah. Um... Individual Americans are all pretty much universally awesome. I do not understand American politics. I inadvertently make enemies among Americans when I start talking about their politics. I don't mean to, right? And you know what? I I just don't understand some logic, that's all. All right. Story Girl says she'll be on for about two or three hours. Birdie B says this stream was a good stream. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Story Girl says, and yes, I agree. This has been a wonderfully interactive, genuine community oriented stream. That's what I want to have happen here. That's the space I want this to be. Thank you for making it that kind of space, guys. You're amazing. And I really appreciate it. So yeah, come back next, next week. This is so cool. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Story Girl, Americans in groups, Uggs, Ugg, uh, yeah. Yeah, they can be. Trinidad Hero says, as an American, I would be offended if it weren't so true. Story Girl says, so tribal. Canadians aren't immune to that. I would like to think we are, but we aren't. The difference is we're forced by climate and geography to cooperate. Right? So we... That's why I say when Canadians swear you know, all the time, when they stop swearing, that's when you have to worry. Because that means we've gone into polite mode. And if we've gone into polite mode, that means we feel that there is a tension and there is a threat. And now we are minding what we say and do because we want to cooperate. But something is bothering us, you see, right? When you get the flat, oh yes, yes, I, I think that it would be definitely time for you to stop doing that right now. That's your last warning. 
before we go ballistic. So just, you know, Canadian culture. Yeah. Okay. Author Goddess says, as an American, I agree. Most of my fellows are rather ignorant of international nuances. I do not blame Americans individually for this. I blame the education system, which is, shall we say, self-focused. I will leave it at that. Birdie B says, most Americans don't understand American politics. That's probably true, eh? Yeah. Author Goddess says, I sure don't. Fair enough. Story Girl says, that's not untrue for Australia either. Oh, sorry, eh? <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, eh? Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Can, if there's a video somewhere on YouTube you should check out about Canadian sorry. Canadian sorry means a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily mean we apologize. Right? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it means you're fucking wrong. <laughs> Sometimes it means... I don't care if you like it or not. Sometimes it means, uh, gee, isn't that too bad? Like, there's, you know, there's a lot of meanings for sorry. It's very close to the American, or to Australia's use of the, of the F-bomb. Yeah. Our F-bomb means a lot of different things, too. Yeah. But probably yours is more creative. I, I think... I think it was an Aussie who said the first time I'd ever heard, well, F the F and F or then, I mean F. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Trinidad Hero says, it's all fun and games until the Canadians get quiet. Mm hmm Yeah, you got it. Yeah, Author Goddess says, well, it's also hard and discouraged for Americans to travel. Certainly we are restricted from doing it the way the Europeans get to. Yeah, I get you there. Canada can be like that too. And in part, that's geography, right? We're so big and there's so much land mass. And the way North America works is actually easier for us to go north and south than it is for us to go east to west. So we do, we get very regional here. Every province has a very different character, right? Um, your idea of what is Canadian will change drastically depending upon I mean, like, pick any province and it'll be different, right? BC is very different from Alberta, even, right? Which is very different from, you know, Saskatchewan, right? Which And Manitoba, right? They, they have totally different characters, right? And don't even get into the differences between Quebec and, you know, some of the maritime provinces. And, and you know, and the maritime provinces aren't even the same, right? We tend to lump them in and then the north is it's totally, yeah, we're very regional, right? Because we're so big and because it's difficult to move east to west, more Canadians travel in the United States than they do in Canada, right? Or at least they did. I don't know if that's going to continue, right? But yeah, Europeans are very fortunate in that it is much less difficult and much less time for them to go from one country to another in, in many ways. That's really impressive, right? So it's good that they have that. I wish Canadians had that too. Yeah. Um, story girl. Yeah, illustrating. I'm sorry you're so stupid. I'm sorry I had to listen to that, etc. Yes, different uses of sorry. Often it is very passive aggressive. Author Goddess says flights are hella expensive. Don't I know it? Don't I know it? And it's not like gas is like much cheaper, you know? I hear you. Trunded Hero says, I have found more people claim more loyalty to their state than the federal government here in the States. That's interesting. Probably true. I, I don't know. I'll take your word for it. I tend to find that in Canada, we tend to be, except for uh, Quebec and Alberta, we tend to be more loyal to our country than we do our province. We tend to think of ourselves more as Canadians than we do as you know, I, I suppose I, I must clarify that I'm speaking for the non-First Nations populations of Canada. I don't know. Different First Nations probably view themselves as, you know, Haida first, right? As opposed to Canadian. And that's fair, right? 
Um, Story Girl says, well, going all the way north is way longer than east-west, but almost nobody lives all the way north. Yeah. I imagine it's climate related, right? Like that's the case in Canada. Everybody, like what something like 80% of our population or maybe even 90% lives within a hundred kilometers of the United States border. And that is because that is, you know, on the other side of the planet, that is the most hospitable climate, right? So that's why, but. Turundid Hero says, where I'm from, North Dakota, there is kind and North Dakota kind, which is very, very different. Story Girl says, okay, gotta go, might catch you later. I will drop in one way or the other. Thanks for joining me and have a great evening. Enjoy your stream. I hope it's awesome. Turundid Hero says, I think it's because our politicians use terms like we Georgians or we Texans and so on. Yeah, and a lot of that probably has its origin even now in the Civil War, right? The American Civil War. So, I don't know, right? Canada evolved in a different way, so we haven't developed quite the same culture that way. Yeah. It's, it's a weird thing. Interestingly, I mean, the history of Quebec, right? Obviously, they were French long before the English showed up and basically took them over to defend themselves and you know against the americans like that that's sort of what happened sorry guys <laughs> that's how our country was basically started you know hmm them americans down there look kind of threatening we should do something about this we need to cooperate that that's how canada got formed so that explains a lot and it was initially you know first nations and french and english which are three peoples that uh if, if I can refer to the First Nations collectively as a people, which is presumptuous, but several peoples that uh, traditionally did not get the hell along at all, banding together for mutual protection. So we learned to be polite. That's how that worked. Right. But, uh, you know, interestingly, Alberta was settled by Americans, right? People who were originally Americans heading you know, in for, you know, settling and migration and I think it had something to do with the gold rush and whatnot, right? So, and, you know, so Alberta has a very different character. It thinks it's Texas. So, I mean, nothing wrong with that except that they tend to brew these large groups that agitate against the rest of us that I find frustrating. But otherwise, okay. You know, Trended Hero says, yeah, actually, fun little fact here, the United States before the Civil War utilized the United States as a singular term. But once the Civil War happened, we changed it to we, the United States of America, which transformed it into a plural term. Oh, that is interesting, actually. That's a different perspective, isn't it? Yeah, that kind of changes how you view it. Okay, guys, it's 20 after the hour. I know I started late, but I gotta go. This has been a lot of fun and I don't want to go. Author Goddess says, it makes sense though. States have a lot of variation in laws, etc. So the US is more like the EU and states more like countries. And that's probably really apt. I think you probably are right about that. Right? Um... Of course, not being American, I can only speak to that from a, an outsider's observational point of view, right? But it seems that way. Yeah. J.M. Baldwin says, I love the stream, Diane. Hope to catch you next time. Thank you. I hope you do, too. I am going to try to catch your stream, and I'm off. This was a lot of fun. Fun times, says Author Goddess. I agree. I'm glad you could join me. It was cool. I, you know... I don't get to see you as often as I like, but that's all right. Uh, um, Author Goddess and I know each other off camera as well. We haven't met in person person, but we've done a lot of things online together. You know, we're friends, so it's cool. And she writes a great, uh, she writes great books. She is a writer. Her name is Sarah Berman, and she writes some amazing work. I'm a big fan of her rune spell series in particular, but I have not disliked anything she has ever written, and I have really loved a lot of it. So, urban fantasy, uh, fantasy romance, a uh, little bit of sci-fi. She's uh, a woman of many talents. She's great. 
Yeah, here, actually, you know what? I'll type her name in the chat so you can find her work. There you go. That's the name you're looking for. She's on Amazon. She has her own website under authorgoddess.com. Right? She's cool. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'll see you again, uh, hopefully, on Sunday. Saturday, we'll be doing our game stream at 6 o'clock Pacific. That's 6 o'clock PM. Uh, at, uh, on Sunday, I hope to do Sable's World Forge again. But, uh, you know, I don't know what time. Oh, thank you, Author Goddesses. You're just as awesome. Well, thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.